Let's go over angular momentum. We start with a mass moving with velocity v. It has a momentum of mass times velocity. But what if we mounted that mass on a massless rod rotated about a pivot? It's now going to have an angular velocity. How can I get rid of v and use omega? Omega times r. Now I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by r. If I bring the r's together, bring it next to the mass, do you recognize this? It's the rotational inertia of that mass. We've just converted the mass times velocity into angular terms. Well, this is linear momentum, and now we've converted this to angular momentum, which will be represented by the letter L. You don't have to derive it every time you use it. Just translate the letters. Let's review linear momentum with an inelastic collision. A cart comes in, hits another cart at rest. Afterwards, they stick together and move off. Why can we say the linear momentum is conserved? The sum of the external forces is zero. The momentum before is M1, V1. The momentum after is both masses stuck together times the final velocity. Now you saw us do this in lab in school with carts, and you did it at home with the magnets on the pendulum. We, we need to come up with something like this for angular momentum. Well, we're going to have a disk rotating. It's going to have an, a mass one, a radius one, and an omega one. Just like this cart had a mass one and a velocity one. The second object is going to be a ring. Radius two, mass two, and the initial omega is going to be zero. I'm going to carefully get this close to the disk and drop it from only like a centimeter above, and there's going to be a collision. So the before picture turns into the after picture with the ring sitting on top of the disc and it's all rotating at an angular velocity final. Well, just like we said linear momentum before equals the linear momentum after, we can do the same for angular momentum as long as the sum of the external torques equals zero. Over here, we have the sum of the external forces equals zero. Well, that's why we had these wheels. It won't work if there's outside forces stopping this motion. Well, we have to mount this on a frictionless turntable to allow it to rotate without any external torques. Will there be an internal torque? Sure, just like there was internal forces. This cart slowed down and this cart sped up. It was an internal force that caused that to happen. Well, when this ring lands on the disc, the ring is going to speed up and the disc is going to slow down. There's an internal torque that made that happen. That's how the momentum gets transferred. And the sum of the momentum stays the same on both sides. Well, instead of talking about M1, V1, we have I1, omega 1. And in the end, since they're stuck together, we have I1 plus I2. They both have the same final angular velocity. Well, what are these I's? You might recall that I for a ring is M R squared. M is all at the full R. I for the disc has a one half in front of it. The mass is distributed throughout. So how do we do this lab? We have it all right here for you. There's the rotating disc. Here's the ring. The ring started to speed up while the disc slowed down. The angular momentum was transferred. The net momentum stayed the same. We have a lightweight, low friction axle. We'll ignore the inertia of this axle. You can see that it spins pretty well. So that means there's no external torques. Mass of the disc is 1,442 grams. Mass of the ring is 1,437.2 grams. So they're almost the same mass. I get a diameter of about 22.8 centimeters for the disc. And I'm going to measure the ring from the center of the metal. We normally use the radius all the way to the outside, but this ring isn't exactly completely thin. It has a thickness to it. So I'm going to go from the center of the metal on this side to the center of the metal on that side, and I get a diameter of about 11.7 centimeters. 
time for you to go measure some angular velocities. We're going to start off with an initial angular velocity. You can play the video back in slow motion and time it. Now you can time the final angular velocity. You'll have your experimental values. Compare that to the theoretical final angular velocity. Let's get some data up here. First, we'll find the inertia of the ring. The mass is 1.437 kilograms, and the radius is half the diameter. I've converted it to meters, 0 0.0585 meters. I get I for the ring, 0 0.00492 kilogram meter squared. I for the disc is going to be one half the mass times the radius squared. Again, I took the diameter and cut it in half. And so I have I for the disc of 0 0.00937 kilogram meter squared. And now we'll say the angular momentum before equals the angular momentum after. Well, we have it all set up here. So I have the inertia of the disc, that's down here, times the initial angular velocity of that disc equals, well, where did that number come from? Hey, it's both of these added up. So it's the inertia of both the ring and the disc together times the final angular velocity. You're going to measure this angular velocity in slow motion. And then you can calculate the omega final. That'll be your theoretical final angular velocity. And then you can compare it to the experimental final angular velocity by timing this one on the video as well. Now, I know you all wish you had one of these things at home to do the lab with, right? Well, you do. Remember the fidget spinner? You get this thing spinning, video it. There you go. Both cans are treated like a disc. You got to remember that the inertia of the bottom one is going to include the inertia of the fidget spinner. So you want to get the mass of this whole thing, and you can approximate it to be a disc. I know it's not exactly a disc, but it's close enough. So if you do the lab at home, you won't have a ring. You're going to be using a disc on a disc. And it doesn't even have to be a tuna can. You can still use your CD disc spinner and put maybe the drink coaster on top. All right, get to work, and we'll try more problems like this later.